Today, we are joined by Dr. Indrajit Kumaraswamy, Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. An economist by profession, he began his career at the Central Bank of Sri Lanka and went on to serve the Minister of Finance and Planning, the Commonwealth Secretariat and later the private sector. Good morning, Governor, and thank you for taking the time from a busy schedule to meet with us today. So, um, it's been a tough year for the country, economically speaking. And at the start of this year, there was already talk about recession coming, and then the tragic Easter Sunday attacks happened. So, how has the economy fared, given all this? Clearly, the heinous effects um, in April this year have had a significant impact on the economy. There have been several channels through which the economy has been affected. The balance of payments have been affected, particularly through, through the effects on the tourism system and the ecosystem around it. Uh, the government's budget has been affected, revenue has uh, been affected, and there have been additional expenditure that the government has had to incur. And of course, employment incomes uh, have all been adversely affected. So one shouldn't underestimate the impact uh, of these events. Uh, in fact, the central bank has revised its growth projection for the year from 4% to 3.1%. Uh, but what we are beginning to see is a significant amount of resilience. The Sri Lankan economy and the Sri Lankan people have over the years shown a great deal of resilience. And we are beginning to see that kick in again. Uh, in fact, the tourism sector is clearly the most uh, impacted uh, segment of the economy. And there again, we are beginning to see some recovery. Um, the arrivals in June and July uh, were significantly higher month by month. But of course, they're still, you know, much less than they were in the corresponding months last year. Uh, but it's an upward trend. And from all accounts, the bookings for the winter season are not bad. Um, some of the selling is going to be at discount. Uh, discounted prices, so the receipts are going to be affected. The central bank has revised down the receipts, uh, the projected re receipts from tourism to an original 5 billion US dollars for this year, down to about 3.7 billion. But we are somewhat fortunate in the sense that the trade account has improved significantly uh, and that is helping to offset the reduction uh, in tourism imports. In fact, the trade deficit has come down by about uh, 2 billion US dollars uh, when you compare this year, first half of this year with the first half of next year. So that's giving us some uh, uh, mitigating uh, effects. So, if you, so the external account, uh, despite the impact on the tourism sector, um, we see a significant amount of stability as reflected by the fact that the rupee has so far appreciated by about 3.2% uh, this year. I wouldn't say the economy is roaring along because all this is happening with growth at 3%. Now, we need to get these outcomes with growth at 6%. Now, when you say that, when I tell you that things are going well at 3%, that's like driving the car at 30 miles per hour and saying that the engine is not overheating. I have to be able to tell you that I'm driving at 60 miles per hour and the engine is not overheating. So that's where we need to get to. So the situation is okay, but we need to improve. So you would give the economy a pretty reasonable um, diagnosis, like a very good diagnosis? I would say that things are fairly stable, okay. but we need to do better. We need to maintain our discipline, we need to make sure that the elections don't lead to a large slippage in the, on the fiscal side because historically the budget deficit has been the main source of instability in the system. So we need to contain that. You know, the improvement on the external side has been, yes, due to import compression, due to lower growth, uh, and also due to the depreciation of the exchange rate. But what is encouraging is that exports, month after month, exports are increasing. And in the first six months of the year, they increased by about 5.6%, I believe. So, yeah, the numbers are okay, but we can't be complacent because we're still only driving at 30 miles per hour. 
So you mentioned fiscal slippage, uh, and given that we are heading into like the presidential elections later this year, um, how do you think this political uncertainty will have like bearing on the economy? Especially now, I, uh, we, we know that the government is going to go for a vote of account uh, given the elections. How do you think this would affect like our finances, basically? Well, one thing to say is, you know, since 1950, we have been having elections. So th this is not something new for us. Uh, and of course, you know, the political rhetoric heats up and there's a lot of untidiness and... Uh, but, you know, as I said, the underlying fundamentals are not bad. And I suspect we're not going to get a bounce back in the economy till after the election, because both domestic and foreign investors are probably adopting a wait-and-see attitude till the elections are over. But I don't see any major disturbance. There, there is no need for that to happen because, you know, we know, I mean, we know all about elections, we have them all the time. Uh, you know, it's, uh, people will listen to what politicians are saying, believe some things, not believe others. I mean, you, you know, this is a normal kind of uh, event for us, which distracts us, but hopefully doesn't have a fundamental impact on the economy. Okay. So you're not worried about election goodies? Well, that, that, as I said earlier, that, that is, you know, that we have to maintain fiscal, slip, fiscal discipline. Uh, they, you know, our debt dynamics are precarious. They can be managed. They can be managed. But if we let go in terms of going outside the framework, the government has a medium term revenue enhancement based fiscal consolidation strategy. So there can be some leeway because of what has happened in April. But if you need to keep the broad framework in place, if we go outside that, then the debt dynamics become worse. And the challenge of managing it will become much more difficult. And we don't have much room. We have very limited room to maneuver. So we can manage the situation. But if the fiscal slippage is significant, then we don't have much space. You know, it, it is, it's, it's a precarious situation, but a manageable situation. If there's significant fiscal situ uh, uh, slippage, it will become an even more precarious situation and the prospects of managing it will become much less. Um, so, Governor, in your opinion, if, um, if you look at Sri Lanka's peers, they're doing much better than the country. So if we are, if we as a country, are to leapfrog our peers, uh, what are the top three things that you think the country must do? Um, in other words, like if you were the economic plan in charge, what would you uh, do to ensure that there's equitable growth for everyone? Of course, from the central bank's perspective, stability is the most important thing. And historically, we have had macroeconomic stress, macroeconomic instability flowing out of the government's budgetary operations. So we have to put that right. We have to maintain fiscal sustainability. And the central bank, historically, has tended to accommodate unsustainable fiscal policies by allowing fiscal forbearance, by having monetary policies which accommodate loose fiscal policies, i.e. fiscal forbearance. We have to move away from that. And we are trying to introduce a new Monetary Law Act, which will give the central bank autonomy and bring with it also greater accountability. Um, the central bank, in order to be able to focus on, on price stability in a way that is not distracted by fiscal forbearance as we've had in the past, there the governance of the central bank we are proposing should also be changed so that uh, you separate the treasury and the central bank clearly in the governance structure. At the moment the ST is a member of the monetary board. The proposal is not to have treasury representation so that the central bank can focus on price stability so that we can not have the kind of conditions which created the fiscal forbearance of the past. Um, so, Governor, you mentioned that price stability and by extension uh, maintaining a low inflation regime is quite important. So, um, in terms of um, maintaining like a sound economy that's, that, that make, ensures that stakeholders like companies and people can plan for the long term, would you consider inflation and price stability to be like the number one targets? Absolutely, that's a core objective of the central bank, of any central bank really. I think, you know, one thing you must remember, of course, price stability is important for planning by companies. 
and households. But the most important point to remember is that the poor suffer disproportionately from inflation. Inflation is a highly regressive implicit tax on the poor because rich people own assets, assets which increase in value with inflation. And therefore these assets act as a hedge against inflation. The poor don't own assets. So there is a disproportionately severe impact on the poor when you have high inflation. So the most pro-poor thing a central bank can do is to keep inflation low. Um, so, Governor, now, since we, we see a small recovery in tourism um, and other destinations that have usually been hit with uh, by terror attacks, which have taken about anywhere between 12 to 14 months to recover, but we are starting to see a recovery coming in early, and like you mentioned, winter bookings are showing encouraging trends. Um, do you think these increasing arrivals can have other spillover effects into the economy? Of course, you know, the tourism, the whole tourism ecosystem was badly affected. I think the big companies have the clout and the buffers to manage and to tide over till, you know, the recovery comes. But the SMEs and individuals selling, you know, handicrafts or food stuff, etc. to the tourism sector and the small scale operators uh, were very badly affected. So getting the numbers up is clearly important and in this respect one of the positive developments uh, that is coming to pass uh, is that uh, my understanding is that the high priest of the Boro community is extremely fond of, of Sri Lanka. I think he comes here very regularly if I'm not mistaken. And he has decided this year to have their annual prayers, his annual prayers. I think it's an eight, nine day uh, event in Sri Lanka. And this is going to bring in 21,000 people, relatively high income earners, who will come and come for the prayers and then obviously travel around the country also before and after the prayers, which I think will give a tremendous boost uh, at this time. Uh, so that is one such thing. And the government is also, after a bit of a delay, now getting its promotion strategy uh, going. Uh, and um, that that again should should um, assist, and, and and this improvement that we are seeing hopefully will gather momentum as we go along. And the tourism sector, I think, because of all the kind of uh, the externalities that are involved, because of the ecosystem, the whole tourism ecosystem, uh, clearly the recovery will greatly help. And the fact that we have this wonderful product, ranked one by the Lonely Planet Guide, um, means that this is a low-hanging fruit in terms of driving growth, in terms of driving employment uh, in the future. Um, so, Governor, coming back to your personal life, not many know this, but you were an outstanding, not only were you an outstanding scholar, you were also a, a great sportsman. Um, you played rugby and cricket, you led Sri Lanka and both CR and FC. Um, what are the most important lessons you learned on the playing field and how have you applied them to your professional life? You know, I, I often say when I talk to young people uh, that I probably learned more on the playing field than I did at school or university uh, in terms of how to, um, to manage, uh, how to drive for outcomes. Uh, you see, the thing about sport is, um, team, team sport in particular, I haven't played uh, individual sports, I'm sure there are advantages there too, but in terms of team sports, you know, a collection of individuals have to focus around a particular goal. You want to win the championship. Okay, so what do we need to do? We need to act collectively. What are the strategies we adopt against each of the opponents? What are the plans we have for the individuals within um, the opposition team? Um, so all that kind of structured thinking and planning and then coming together to make sure that you have the teamwork to execute effectively, all those are good life lessons. And if you're fortunate enough to be able to captain a team, that actually gives you an even greater experience uh, in terms of life skills, uh, to learn to, to, to cope with your work and even your personal life. I think um, I'm a great believer in sport. I'm a great believer in, believer in team sport in particular.
So, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you played your you were a flanker while you played rugby, mm -hmm. and in cricket you were a left hand bowler. Left hand, slow left hand bowler, and, and batted a bit, yeah. Okay. So, do you have a preference for either, either of the two sports, or do you follow both sports? Well, the good thing about my time was that there were clearly demarcated seasons. Okay. You know, the rugby season and cricket season were different. So my wife had a problem because half the year I was on the cricket field and half the year I was on the rugby field. But I was very lucky, though we got married when we were very young, having met at university. Um, she put up with uh, the first 10, 12 years of our marriage me, with me spending large amounts of time on the, on the sports fields. So do you still, you still follow the sports to the day, right? I mean, yes, permitting yes, a schedule. Um, so, I mean, I'm partial here. There's, I love my rugby too. And um, what are your thoughts on the upcoming World Cup? Who do you think has the best shot at it? Yeah, well, you know, I, I initially I thought New Zealand because, you know, in the period between the two World Cups, New Zealand have been dominant. But then just recently they've had one or two not such good results and they were beaten soundly by Australia and South Africa and drew with them. Uh, but again, they had a great performance last weekend. Um, and I've been a fan of New Zealand rugby for, from the time I was a child since I started following rugby. And they're all going to be very formidable, clearly. But the South African side has improved. Uh, they went through a bit of a dip. Uh, and the Aussies, you know, are always competitive. Any World Cup event, they are great sportsmen. I mean, that, that whole culture in Australia of, of competition, I think, from the time they're little kids, they will, they will be competitive, but I think New Zealand definitely probably the favourites still. And for the Northern Hemisphere, you know, Ireland have been good, but I think they're ageing a bit. Um, England have a good side, uh, but they haven't been consistent. Uh, so they will be a threat. So I think for me, probably New Zealand, South Africa. Um, with, if England come together, they have the personnel. Uh, to be a threat as well. Um, so, Gavin, how do you balance your professional commitments with your personal life? Do you have like a hobby or something that, that lets you decompress? Well, I know uh, when I played sport, uh, clearly that, that was, uh, uh, in fact, pr probably was too much of a distraction, uh, but, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. But I stopped playing, you know, serious organized sport, I think, when I was 31, 32, so it's been a long time now. I'm, 69, so it's a long time without playing serious sport. I still watch sport a lot. I'm a bit of a news junkie, you know, I spend time watching Bloomberg and, and uh, some of the 24-hour news channels. Um, and, um, you know, my wife is my biggest supporter and also my toughest critic, so I spend time with her. So, yeah, so those, those are some of the things. Um, after a long day spent between meetings and attending to all central bank stuff, everything that comes part, as part and parcel of being governor, um, how do you unwind after a long day at work? Well, I, you know, I probably, um, as I said, watch some television. I, I, I used to read more than I do now. Somehow I, I find myself reading less than I used to. Uh, partly because I probably read quite a lot uh, while I'm at work. Uh, uh, so it, it's, it's kind of sports and news and, you know, family. Uh, of course, our kids are in London uh, and our grandkids. Um, so, you know, the fact that they're not here uh, is, is um, a bit of a challenge. But, yeah, the, the, I, I would say sport and, and news and just... Uh, uh, and when my wife is here, yeah, and, 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 and friends, and friends. Okay, Governor, so finally, I mean, there are loads of young people who might be watching this, and for them also, like, they, are, they live in a time where the economy itself is going through a transition, where it's moving from the industrialized past to a very much more knowledge-driven future. Um, what words of advice would you have for, like, young people nowadays, like, in terms of, like, how to plan out their careers and things like that? I, I think, clearly, the premium attached to education, training, or skills development is getting higher and higher. You know, that they talk of, there's the talk of the fourth industrial revolution, um, there's talk of uh, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, uh, the, the 3D printing. I mean, you know, there, there are going to be fewer and fewer people who are going to produce massive wealth. So if you want to get into that group, who is going to be at the center of wealth creation, you need to acquire the skills. And 
and the experience to do that. But as societies, we are going to have to completely restructure our thinking. Because I think in 10, 15 years, our societies are going to look very, very different. Uh, you know, I'm not a Marxist, but I think Marx's analysis needs to be looked at carefully. And I think some of what he said is coming true. He said that capitalism was the most efficient means of developing product productive capacity. And that we're seeing. Modern technology has, it has tremendous, vast capacity for wealth creation. It's going to increase even more. But that wealth is getting concentrated amongst fewer and fewer people, which he foresaw. He, of course, thought there would be a revolution in the, in the 19th century, but that, that didn't happen for various reasons. And I don't think we need to have a revolution even now if we organize our societies. People talk about a universal basic income. Uh, I personally think it's inevitable uh, that we will have to have that, to have a safety net. The question is, how are we going to accommodate this inexorable advance, accelerating advance in technology and make sure that it works in a way that benefits a very broad cross-section of our people. And what are the, the mechanisms, the instrumentalities we need to develop to make sure that these benefits flow into different groups of people. I mean, you can even, you can begin to see how it happens. Now, we pay large amounts of money to golf players, tennis players, cricketers now, and all that. So maybe we'll have to pay people for a wider, you know, something that's different than work as we have known for a few centuries. All right, that brings us to the end of our interview, Gamal. Thank you so much for joining with us, and it's been a pleasure to have you on board.